Hello, everyone. Welcome to All Things College and Career, the podcast to turn to for all of your college and career planning needs. We are your hosts, Meg Gary and Bobby Ryan, owners of Academic and Career Advising Services located in Kennebunk, Maine. We started this podcast to provide helpful information to listeners researching careers, colleges, or academic majors. Choosing your career or a college is such a big decision, which is why our motto is learn before you leap. Before investing a lot of time or money, it's so important to do your research and to really explore your options. Each podcast will offer interesting stories and valuable insights that we think you will find entertaining and informative. Subscribe to our podcast and you'll have it ready to go on your playlist every Monday morning. So learn before you leap each week with us. Are you interested in marketing, business management, or sales? Are you currently looking for a job or trying to move up or switch positions within your company? Are you interested in economics, marketing, business management, or pursuing an MBA? If so, then this podcast is for you. True that. Today we have (laughs) Rob Egan, one of the nation's leading marketing and business management professionals. Yes, Rob is amazing. He has worked at a very high level in some of the world's most well-known corporate Operations, along with some mid-sized companies and startups, which really gives him a unique perspective. And today, Rob shares with you endless tips and advice for anyone interested in marketing, business, or looking for a job. You can definitely learn a lot from him, so you do not want to miss this conversation. So let's get started. Let's do it. Hello, Rob Egan. Welcome to All Things College and Career. Thank you so much for doing the podcast today. Oh, great. My pleasure to be here. (laughs) Good morning, Rob. Thanks for being here with us today in our Kenny Bunk office. We're happy to have you and we're excited to learn all about your career in marketing. Good. Look forward to it. So, Rob, let's dive right in. Can you tell us three things that you love about your job? Oh, I enjoy the uh, pace of the job because you're always busy and you right. know, taking care of lots of different things. I like the external view because you're thinking not only about internally within the company, but also our external customers. And uh, I just enjoy influencing people's perceptions of the company. Interesting. I like the influencing part. Yeah. That can't be an easy thing to do. No, it's a, it's a, both an art and a science. I bet. You, yeah, you have to think about how to influence people, but what messages will resonate with them as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure it's important to have that team under you that's helping you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Push that message forward. Can't do it alone. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let's go back to where it all began and talk a little bit about your college career and when you first became interested in management and marketing. Did yeah, that was start it back in, in high school or, or did college? Yeah. Or, yeah. or was, did it come later in life? It definitely came later in life. It did. Yeah. Okay. So uh, when I was in college, I had to pick a major and that's yeah. when I really had to think through, okay, well, where are my passions? What do I enjoy? Right. And I picked an economics major, which was the closest they had to business at St. Lawrence University, where I went. And that helped gave me focus about what I wanted to pursue. So you chose economics because you like the math? Uh, More because I like the concepts of Mm -hmm. what does influence economic behavior and how you do business. It it really was the closest major to a business major. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. And why did you pick St. Lawrence? Pick St. Lawrence, it's a small liberal arts school. It's in a very rural environment. I wasn't looking for a big school. I was looking where I could have more impact and be more engaged with my professors and students. Right. It was a great fit. Did you like the proximity to Canada? Yeah, I did, but we didn't end up going to Canada as much as I thought we might. (laughs) But um, it was very rural, and rural meant that it was not easy to leave the campus community. And so it became more tight knit. Yeah, Uh, absolutely. So it was harder to get to, but once you were there, it was a special experience. So I really enjoyed that. Well, full disclosure, both my daughters looked at that school and uh, my husband and I both loved it. It is very remote and very rural, but amazing facilities for such a small school. They had their own like hockey rink and golf course and running trails. It was Mm -hmm. amazing. An incredible culture. It's a a school for people. Uh, They really emphasize the holistic human being, not Mm -hmm. just the academic side. Mm -hmm. And I felt that to be a, a positive environment to grow up in. 
Yeah, for sure. And how do you feel like the alumni network there is? Are you still in touch with your alumni? It's very strong. It is hard to keep up with, though. Sure. You know, as uh, children and career Mm -hmm. and outside interests came into play, you know, you have to balance how much time there is really for the alumni network. But it's an important school. And when someone reaches out, uh, you know, LinkedIn has really changed things. So now any student can reach out to me based on their own search. They don't have to be introduced to me by the career services office. Hey, I went to St. Lawrence University. And I noticed you did as well. Uh, exactly. And I always respond. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's awesome. Which makes sense. And, you know, I always tell people, feel free to come back to me anytime. But oh. be- if I don't respond, it doesn't mean that I'm not interested. It might mean I just lost your email right. among the 10,000 right. other ones. So, so stay <laughs> persistent. I'm sure you can. No, and that's a good tip in so many areas is that, you know, you reach out once. If it's someone that's busy, has a lot of LinkedIn exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. contacts. Yeah, you know, you might have to reach out a few times, right? Absolutely. So yeah. would you like to tell us a little bit about your graduate school experience? Sure. I went to the Kellogg School, a Northwestern Business School, and uh, it was a great experience. It's known for its marketing, mm-hmm. and that's what I wanted to specialize in, so I wanted to be in the best. It's a, it's a people school as well. It has mm-hmm. a very similar personality to a St. Lawrence where they really emphasize the whole person. They require that everybody is interviewed to get into the school because mm-hmm. they want to make sure that it's a good cultural fit with you. A lot of teamwork, which is really replicates what the work environment's like. You have to get along with people. So it gets you ready for the real world it pretty does. well. Yeah, It does. That's not an easy school to get into. So what would you say, I mean, obviously you must have had good grades at St. Lawrence, but did you do anything else to help improve your chances of getting into the Kellogg School? Well, of course I did all the things that you yeah. need to do, like study for the test. Right. right? Yeah. So, the GRE. Or the, or the yeah. GMAT, maybe. Yeah, the GMAT. Oh, yeah. yeah. The GMAT, of course. Yeah. For the business, and yeah. so that's an important part. But Mm -hmm. it's not the whole story. And you need to be willing to go beyond that. And I, what I would say is when you're applying to school is whatever your weakness is, address it head on. Oh, I like that. Don't wait for them mm. to ding you because right. you have low GMATs. Talk about how I don't do well in GMATs. Right. Right. I'm not a test um, taker. <laughs> I'm not a test taker. However, yeah. here are proof points that I do well in math or I do well in English in my job. There you go. So yeah. I've just been reading up and listening to some experts on interviewing and they say to do that in an interview you as well to put your weaknesses right out there and come forward with what they're thinking in the back of their mind like ooh, I don't know about this and if you just come right out with it and beat them to the punch so to speak well yeah it's all about a dialogue yeah. Interviews are not really, it's not they ask question and you reply. Mm-hmm. It's you're trying to create a dialogue. You're trying to make an emotional connection with somebody to be an advocate for you. And it's really important within the first five, ten minutes to just get started on the right foot. To and make that personal connection or Make engagement. that personal connection. Be likable. Because mm-hmm. if you're likable, then they're more willing to listen to what your credentials are. Because mm. there's really two pieces. One, is this a person I want to Around right. in my life. Do I want to work with this person day <laughs> exactly. in and day out? Right. Exactly. And then two, can they do the job? Those are two very different questions. Lots of people can do the job. Not everybody you can work with. Good point. That's, That's great. Great That's tip. Absolutely true. Anybody? I know when I've ever been on the hiring end of anything, I'm definitely looking at, can I work with this person? Yeah. Right. I yeah. mean, because a lot of people come in, well, they, they all have similar qualifications. I think they could all do the work. And everybody has a gap in something. Right. Right. There right. is no perfect candidate. Exactly. <laughs> and so what you have to do is just let them know that whatever gaps are perceived can be filled because you have the right attitude. Give them the confidence that you can overcome that gap. Exactly. Yeah. You're smart, you're engaged, and you're going to work hard. Right. Yeah. You can and they won't it. regret hiring you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so do you do a lot of hiring, Rob? I do a ton of hiring. Oh, my yeah. goodness. So you would be such a great person to ask all these questions to. We could do a whole nother podcast on just how to interview. <laughs> do you want to give just maybe one or two of your best interviewing tips? Would that be it? The, what you just said? Yeah. Be human. Be candid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Be authentic as to much as possible, right. right? Yes, you're nervous. Yes, you want the job. Yes, you want to prove you can do it. But right. also just have confidence that mm-hmm. if it's not the right fit, there might be another opportunity. Mm-hmm. A lot of people feel like if I don't get this one specific job and they put too much emphasis on that, right. it's a journey. Any job hunt is a journey. And you're having multiple touch points. And any of those touch points could end up in the perfect job for you now or several years from now. Yeah. They might think yeah. of you 
down the road when something comes up. So exactly. Yeah, that's such a great tip. Yeah, I like that tip too. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to circle back to your MBA and ask you how long did it take? And also, what do you think of an executive MBA versus a regular MBA program? So I went to the full time right. two year MBA program. Yep. I loved it. It was like going back to school again, going back to undergraduate. It was very social. It was engaging. You're surrounded by people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. You have an incredible number of resources at your fingertips. And it's a a wonderful sabbatical. Um, (laughs) Yes, it was hard work, but because it was so interesting and intellectually Mm. stimulating, it was just a great opportunity. It also was quite expensive, right? (laughs) And it had a huge opportunity cost to it because not only are you paying during those two years, you're also not Not earning earning. income. Mm -hmm. So I think you really have to think about your life's journey and where you're at, but also since students are often going back for the MBA at an older age, then there's even greater opportunity costs for, okay, you know, it takes a year or two to get in, yeah. two years to do the MBA, then you have to get your career started once you come out. Right. How does a family fit into that overall picture right. or other life goals that you may have? So it's really all about balance. So I really encourage people to look at the executive program. Probably a part of your life where it would work in well, the executive program. Exactly. When you're... There's a lot more options out there. Right. It does not have to be a full in-person two-year experience. Uh, there's weekend programs. There's one-year accelerated programs. In your opinion, are they viewed any differently? They might be, but it's still an MBA. Yeah. And I think there's a lot more open opinions about how to approach that right now. The cost is very significant, both time as well as resources. And they get that. And so I think you might actually be viewed as a more efficient person who really went ahead and made it juggling other things right yeah these are great tips coming from somebody that's been through the ranks a bit and looking back choices that could have made life a little easier along the way perhaps but mm-hmm. but no regrets no regrets you know i always advise people that you don't have to get an mba right an right. mba is an optional approach to your career mm-hmm. and it won't necessarily change your ability to do your job I mean, I was the same person out of business school as I went into business school. It did not give me any specific skills that I didn't already have because business is all about applying yourself, using your intelligence, working with other people and problem solving. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like the specific experience I got in the classroom changed my life any more than Mm -hmm. my undergraduate experience. What it does do, though, is gives as there's transitions later in life, right, because most people will have multiple jobs in multiple different companies throughout their career, is when those transitions occur, it gives you the credibility right. and the seal of approval to get on the short interview list. Yeah. Right. And so a lot of the benefits from an MBA actually come much later than life, not necessarily right out of school. Now, it can help you if you're a career changer, you're in finance, you want to go to marketing, not an easy transition to make. It's much easier to make out of business school. But there's lots of ways to get there. Mm-hmm. So are okay. employers primarily looking for your skill set and your ability to do the job? in the MBA is just kind of a nice plus that might bump you up a little bit in the application process? I think most employers view MBAs as a screening tool. Mm -hmm. That they know they've been through some sort of tested gauntlet. Exactly. There's, I mean, thousands of people, because you can apply on that line now, thousands of people apply to these jobs, right? Mm. And you don't even have time to read all those resumes. So now you need more screens to work through. One screen is an MBA just because it puts a different type of caliber person in front of you. The other screen is... Anybody who knows somebody through LinkedIn. When we post a job now, often a thousand people apply and often we'll have 50 to 70 referrals. That means somebody who knows somebody via LinkedIn that works at my company and those do get read. So if something comes internal, even if they don't know the individual, it's so important. It will just mean, okay, there's a pile for those that look really good there's the pile for somebody new somebody and so at least just read it yeah right that's such an important tip if you can get a referral and get your resume put in front of the hiring person hiring manager it gives you such an advantage because you may not be any better for the position but you're just being looked at or just Just having a Referral from somebody that you trust. And a referral doesn't, I mean, there's several levels of referrals. Referrals, one can be, I know this person. Yeah, mm-hmm. somebody and walks into your office and says, yeah, we got to get this guy in here. This exactly. Guy's right. And they advocate level. for you. Yeah. But there's another level of referral, which is also can be quite effective, is I don't know this person well, but 
can you just take a look at it? Right, right. 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 Maybe we went to the same college and they reached out to me. So passed it along. Passed, yeah. it, passed it, along. it along. Yeah. It also speaks to the importance of your LinkedIn profile. Obviously, the more connections you have, it improves your odds of getting your resume passed along for an interview. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. LinkedIn is an absolutely critical tool for anybody in business absolutely. now. Right. Whenever I interview somebody, the first mm-hmm. thing I do is go to LinkedIn. Check their LinkedIn profile. I don't right. look at their resumes. Mm-hmm. I just like their LinkedIn. Often there's inconsistencies between resumes and LinkedIn. And so that is very telling. That's a red flag. For, so then yeah. I always go to, well, why are they different? Or what mm-hmm. story are they trying to tell right. for me? Yeah. Remember, LinkedIn is a profile for everybody. It's not it's customized public. by the job. Job, right? right. So people will know so they're applying impressive. for this job and then they'll pivot to Absolutely. that. Um, Absolutely. People they, tend not to inflate their experience as much because they know all their friends are connected in. And right. You're like, wait, so you didn't a, do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? I yeah. try that. <laughs> but, but again, then you really know if they really want the position yeah. they're applying to versus where their heart could be really somewhere else, but they just threw this resume at you. And so you want to check out to make sure that... Well, Yeah, I want to check it out. And also what picture they choose can be very Mm -hmm. telling. I mean, if you have what is clearly a social picture, um, that's a message you're sending, (laughs) right? right? Like particularly if you're at a wedding with a drink in your hand or something, right? That is just not the image you want. Even the picture you choose in the background, you have the standard one Mm -hmm. or you can have pictures of a mountain. Now, a mountain isn't necessarily a bad thing. Right. It says that you are an adventurer or you have an outdoor side that's important to you. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean you're out for the job, but you are creating a picture of who you are as a persona. I'm going to have to check my back. <laughs> it's, it's your brand. What the heck do I have there right yeah. now? It is your brand. Yeah. Well, I actually had on my list of questions to get into some LinkedIn tips and advice from you because you do have a significant or vibrant LinkedIn profile or following. So what could you tell us about that? Well, I'd say the thing about LinkedIn is I really enjoy being part of that community. You know, the people that I seek after are are people that have good content creators because I like reading the news feed. The feed is both yeah. specific to my function, marketing, as well as to my industry, healthcare. These are some of the thought leaders in the community and what they post, what the comments are, and my participation in that is very important to me. Okay. So I do think it helps you be a smarter business person. It's basically a customized news feed specific to your role in your industry, mm-hmm. which can be a real game changer. Right. And do you think it's important for people to to follow their industry leaders and comment and be interactive. Yeah, if you have something meaningful to say. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely, but it can yeah, be short. Yeah, don't just fill up the news feed with nothingness. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's all short and piffy, sort of digestible. Mm-hmm. Um, I also would link in everybody within your company that you interact with, that you respect, where people leave the company, and yeah. it's easy to forget where they went. And this right. is a way to find former colleagues. You really have to think of your career over multiple years and multiple transitions. The likelihood of having one job and staying in that company and in that function for 30 years is highly unlikely. Particularly in your industry. Exactly. You know, there's some physicians, maybe teachers, or right. that may stay with a certain organization over a lifetime or a good chunk of it, but it seems that people in business or marketing and management, they change quite Constantly. frequently. Every yeah. couple years. Yeah. And so yeah. you need LinkedIn as a vehicle to help you keep track of colleagues yeah. and expand your network. That makes such good sense. Um, I also, when I meet somebody, I always link them in within a week. That if I respect them, I don't yeah. link in to people I don't respect. Mm-hmm. But right. uh, and you do it quickly because if you wait, then it's You'll awkward. Like, yeah, or oh, they'll forget. Yeah, where did I meet this person? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's just it's all about timeliness and having a, a system to do it. Hmm. Now, is it important, and especially in marketing and management, to have a large number of followers? Only if it's if it's meaningful, mm-hmm. right? Um, I happen to have a large number, but that's because the nature of my job, I'm out and about, I'm meeting people constantly. And I view it as the different audiences that I want to communicate with. Uh, Mm -hmm. Every single customer that I meet, I linked in with. The reason I do that is because a lot of my news feed is about the company I'm currently with. It's a way for me to get customized content from my company to our current customers. I also do it for employees for the same reason. Pretty much every person in my department, and that's probably about half the company I'm connected to. Mm-hmm. Why is that? That's a way for me to have internal communications news feed. That makes such sense. And I have read from a job seeking position that if you have more followers, say 500 or 
I think 500 is the magic number that you come up a bit higher in, in the search by recruiters if they're searching. What about in the feed? No, I, just in the I don't. I don't know exactly, but I know for recruiters, if they're looking for a bookkeeper, for example, you might not oh, be on page five. You might be on page one of their. Oh, well, okay. any recruiter that approaches you also, you definitely want to LinkedIn because they'll often do searches within their own database. Right? Yes. They don't go to just LinkedIn and search right. for. They, their own. they start with their own because most recruiters will have probably at least 5,000 plus right. people mm. in there. So they'll start within their so own you wanna, network. So for job seekers out there, you would highly recommend they connect with recruiters yeah, on they LinkedIn. They accept those invitations. Yeah, well, yeah. it's it's difficult. I mean, you can only be so persistent. I mean, right. lob it mm-hmm. out there. If they don't take it, then so be it. Right. Right. You know? When you're hiring someone and they say only have 15 LinkedIn <laughs> connections or something. Is that, that a red flag yeah, for you? is that a red flag or is that just, well, they're just not actively trying to be LinkedIn well, or, yeah. I mean, it's a red flag to the extent that if I take it as being lazy yeah. right, and not engaged, right. then that's a big problem. Right. If it's just that they don't have them or they're in a more of a niche role, but most people in marketing yeah. are, need yeah. to be out there. Their personality type is right. that they're out there. And it's required in the job. Exactly. So they need, yeah, right. So. I mean, where I'll most see it is with our interns. Mm-hmm. You know, an intern who either doesn't have a LinkedIn account or right. just has you know, so few people in there. And I'm like, well, okay, are you building a career? Right. Um, have you linked in with your fellow interns? They're going to end up at multiple different companies. Right. Exactly. Have you linked in with everybody in the company you've had a meaningful interaction with, yes. mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And a lot of times it boils down to, oh, I just didn't think of that. Right. And yeah. Yeah. that's not a good approach because it shows that you're not going the extra mile right. to make those contacts. And you would appreciate an intern that is thinking of those things. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And it does influence yeah. me. I mean, yeah. when I interview a candidate at the vice president level, the first thing I do is look at their LinkedIn, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Right. And then Which I is so see, common, by the way, not just you, but exactly. yeah, many hiring people. And then how many mutual contacts do we have? And then I mm-hmm. take a peek at the mutual yeah. contacts. And if it's people who I respect, you are instantly upgraded in right. my mind. You come in more positively predisposed. Right. Just human nature. And even yeah. to the extent if you have no mutual, I'm like, wow, like... What's going on? How here? could you be in this industry and not have any <laughs> yeah. of these? Have they of... been under a rock right. or what? Yeah, <laughs> right. They not know Ted Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody knows Ted. Yeah. 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 Whatever. Yeah. What about recommendations? Like you know how LinkedIn has. Yeah, that's a little trickier. You know, I haven't pursued that angle as yeah. much, but certainly it works. I mean, they all sound kind of canned. Right. Of course. Yeah. Um, right. I guess it can work. I don't really look at those. I can't imagine. I think, like you said, they're a little phony. And, yeah. you know, it depends who's the most persistent about hounding people to give them to them and those sorts of things. And but. so I pretty much have philosophies I don't give them. Yeah. You know, because yeah. I right. find out that the people who ask me are the ones that I'm least likely to really want to recommend. <laughs> yeah. So just as a rule, so just, say, I just general, don't do those. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. That's a good rule. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Um, how about if we dive into your work history just sure. a bit? So you've uh, had a long and interesting and successful career marketing and you've worked for some of America's most well-known companies so and one in London right yes yeah Yeah. so just to name a few Procter & Gamble, Kraft Foods, Grand Metropolitan, Student Universe, First Act, Tufts Health Plan, Aetna and now you're at Improvada. Improvada. Thank you, because I did not know how to pronounce that. But I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you landed these jobs, the advantages and drawbacks of being in marketing, and what a typical day is like, and just tips for listeners that want to break in and follow in your footsteps, so to speak. So out of St. Lawrence, I started my uh, career in sales, okay. and I found it through the St. Lawrence Network. So um, this go. was pre-LinkedIn, and so I just went to the career services office, and yeah. I asked for introduction productions and uh, met somebody along the way and started out in sales. So it was a great start to my career. That's what I did prior to going back to business school. Most of my career has been in marketing, which I really enjoy. Worked for a variety of different companies. The world of marketing has changed substantially. When I started, you know, a good place to start was an agency or doing public relations, more of the soft general messaging, which is still very important marketing, but marketing has gone digital. And Mm -hmm. digital means you can track everything. So if I was to emphasize a career path for a younger person, I would definitely go more into the online digital marketing. I think that applies across more industries, whether it be consumer or business to business type marketing. Mm -hmm. Start there. But as you go on your journey, don't forget 
the old fashioned marketing world as well. It's a good foundation or it is because both matter. What I see many young people on my team is they know digital marketing cold, Mm -hmm. but they're in tunnel vision a little bit Mm -hmm. because what they do is they become very, very good at a specific task. Uh, And they forget the fact that the message matters, the context for the messaging, influencing people matters. They're so focused on the clicks and the the search engine optimization and the campaigns Mm -hmm. and the volume of the campaign, they forget the quality aspect sometimes. Mm. So, and what is old becomes new. So for example, yeah. direct mail. Everything went to digital and direct mail no so longer applied. now that's applied. suddenly special if you get a direct... It is special. Some of our best performing assets right now or levers that we use in marketing are the historic ones. Now, you can't overuse them, but we still do direct mail sometimes. We occasionally mail a book to a prospect in addition to all the tracking you do online. So you have to do both. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can't just do one or the other. It's, I think back when uh, retail stores, originally they had you know actual shops and then there was online stores that popped up. But the real winners long-term are those who can do both online mm-hmm. and physical stores and manage the customer experience across both of them. Same analogy in marketing. You have to be able to do digital as well as traditional marketing marketing and interact between the two of them. That makes total sense and is good to remember in this highly digital world. Exactly. Speaking of which, you have worked internationally quite a bit. Yeah. Can you tell us about that experience? So I've had a variety of different experiences yeah. international. I mean, as my career progressed, I, I love foreign travel. I love diversity of cultures and ideas. Mm. And I've done a variety of situations. One is where I'm based in the U.S. and I'm responsible for all the countries outside of the United States for the marketing initiatives. Mm-hmm. And that was the primary role I had in international. What I found very quickly is it's not as glamorous as it may seem. <laughs> Because right, right. if you're responsible for 36 countries, you have to fly those 36 countries. Uh, oh. And yeah. it's substantial travel. It's also a lot of customization. What international marketing is often about is taking the host country marketing program and then customizing it for different needs across the globe. Mm-hmm. So um, that's pretty work intensive. Yes, it's very work intensive. Yeah, especially because um, it's different for each yeah. scenario. Yep. Exactly. So, But it was a fascinating experience. I really enjoyed it. After a couple of years, though, I decided that I wanted to come back to the U.S. based right. marketing. Less um, travel. Less travel and more consistency. Uh, it's more strategy based in the U.S. where okay. you can have one program for the whole country versus individual ones yeah. for yeah. each. You yeah. probably feel one. like you could put more into the program. You know? Exactly. And it tends to be more sales driven in the individual countries because it's just smaller opportunities. You can't have the big expensive yeah. marketing campaigns even with the company I'm currently with. Uh, you know, We have our national program for the U.S. and Canada. It's right. the same program. But each individual country is customized. Mm-hmm. So the programs have to be smaller and less complex because they're so highly customized. Yeah. You couldn't have the great program that you can when you're just concentrating on one or two countries, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, which I can totally see that. So just circling back, Rob, after St. Lawrence, I know you worked for a while and then you went back and got your MBA. How long did you work before you headed back to graduate school? I worked for three years before going back. And it felt like a right amount of time. Anything Mm -hmm. less, I think I wouldn't have had the work experience to fully leverage the MBA. Going later is an option, but it starts to interfere with other life goals sometimes uh, the later you go. And then you also have to think about the cost and paying back all those loans (laughs) and everything else as well. Right. Yeah, that seems like a good amount of time. And I know talking to people that have done work experience before they graduate work, they can draw from a lot of practical knowledge that they gained working before they head off to that graduate program. Makes it a little bit more Mm -hmm. relevant. Yeah. 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 And easier. Yeah. Because I can draw on things. But That's a good point. Yeah. So as Meg said earlier, you've worked at several companies, probably in many different positions, but we're interested in how it started, how you progressed, and what different types of roles you've been in over the years. Sure. Well, a lot of my uh, experience is with big companies. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's a lot of advantages to big companies. Uh, yeah. You can transfer within internal divisions. You become much more savvy about how the different parts of the business interact. You have to be very uh, aware and confident 
conscious of getting along with groups that have very different needs than you do. You are at a big company. I think you really want to be a bridge between different departments and different divisions Mm -hmm. because very few people play that bridge role. And if you do, you make yourself more valuable to the company because most people don't like that role. And if you can do it and do it successfully, you can help move um, initiatives and agendas forward. I really recommend that if you're in a bigger company. That makes such sense. And maybe somebody that could connect the dots and kind of blend all the needs so you can sort of eat off each other or help each other out a bit. Exactly. And there's multiple ways to do that. There's informal and then there's even some formal. So for example, at Aetna, I was in the uh, technology division, which was a new division for the company. And there was a lot of misunderstanding between why we were acquiring these technology companies, how Mm -hmm. they interacted with the core business. So I made it my business to get to know people. Mm -hmm. Um, I volunteered a lot. I was on the culture committee. Mm -hmm. Um, I made sure that I went to all the town halls. Uh, I provided good content about what our division was doing to the office that put together the town hall meetings so that people had an understanding of what we're doing, why we're doing it, what our mission was. And Mm -hmm. that gave me an opportunity to have a lot more influence and be effective within the organization. Yeah, because you would be a natural person to reach out to if you've provided that content to say, yeah, I'm going to give Rob a call and see. Exactly. Rob was helpful. So let's call him again. Mm -hmm. And so that gave me the opportunity to, by being helpful, to also influence what the agenda was and how we were perceived as a division. And that had enormous benefit. Mm -hmm. And that kind of circles back to how important it is in your industry to be a good influencer. So you basically influenced everybody to appreciate the new division, so to speak. And you want to be known. Right. You don't want to be under a rock or hidden. Mm-hmm. Right. You want to be as visible as possible in a marketing role. That may not be true for all roles, but in marketing, you need to be visible mm-hmm. and you need to make it your mission to be visible. So they think of you. And so yeah, they think of promotions. you and, and for promotions, <laughs> yeah. for opportunities. Mm-hmm. And remember, it's not only at the company you're with. There's a lot of change out in the business world. There's right. a lot of mergers and acquisitions. So uh, when everybody I, meets a potential new job. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so, for example, at Aetna, there was a proposed merger between Humana and Aetna. I was on the integration team. So that meant I know every person uh, in the top leadership positions as Humana. Humana. Well, the deal did not end up going through, but those people are very much still part of my network. I feel like <laughs> so, I worked at Humana, even yeah, though I did. Yeah. And, uh, right. So, so you could call on them if you needed to or vice versa. Exactly. Yeah. So it just makes you more of a known player. You also learn best practices because mm-hmm. by getting a deep understanding of how Humana does business, I learned how some of the pitfalls of what we could do better at Aetna. Oh, right. so, so you could bring that to the table too, saving your company maybe time and money or efficiency. or Exactly. Yeah. Just being a smart business person. So you really want to think about the journey that you're on. You're running a marathon, not a sprint. Mm-hmm. And you're really trying to have an interesting, meaningful career that brings personal satisfaction to you as well as some of the benefits you know, such as the title and the money and whatever else you're looking for out of your career. But those are some great tips on how to reach those. Yeah, Yeah. so have passion. I'd say also focus. You're much better off if you have both a function and an industry. So Mm -hmm. a lot of marketers think, okay, because I'm a good marketer, I can be in any industry. I can sell dog food one day and I can sell technology the next. Not so true. It doesn't work as well as you might think. Yeah, (laughs) because if you really know, as you said, the ins and outs of the industry, that becomes valuable. It becomes much more valuable. Your ramp speed and your contributions become much more significant. And from a hiring perspective, I'm sure like this will be so easy to bring this person up to speed. They already know the industry inside out. Exactly. And there's so much change with mergers and acquisitions. And uh, so you really kind of have to be ready for anything for sure. at a moment's notice. For so. sure, yeah. So you mentioned big companies are a great place to work. What about small companies? Small companies have their trade-offs, and they're, they're obviously quite trendy right now with younger mm-hmm. people. Right. Um, what I think up. is younger people often don't realize is very few individuals are really making money at these startups. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, you're getting your salary and you might be getting a bonus, but you can get that at a big company or a small company. The equity positions are typically fairly limited. Now you have to look at your small company because some companies distribute it much Meaning more evenly. Meaning you get a share of the stock if you you're... Get a sh- exactly. You get a share. You're somehow given stock. Stock if and they sell or if they hit the jackpot. Exactly. But, if there's some sort of event where they sell or IPO. go IPO, then you get a benefit. Now you have to be very careful. Young people will often say, oh, I own stock in this. They forget <laughs> that they own such a small you know, yeah, And by the time it. it gets to... right. 
<laughs> and by the time it gets diluted right. and an event actually happens and taxes are taken out, it might be almost nothing. So it can be very appealing, but it isn't something you should drive your career on. If you want to be at a smaller company, unless you have significant equity share. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, like a founder. Then, <laughs> <laughs> um, then you should be there because you like the small company environment yeah. and you want to make a difference. You shouldn't be there because you, quote unquote, have equity, uh, unless you fully understand what that is. What I've always liked about small companies or startups is that I'm doing so many different jobs. And if that appeals to an individual, mm, that right. might be a good and, place for you. And for a young person, I could see where that would really enhance their skill set if they have to wear many hats. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So you can get a variety of different experiences. Mm-hmm. You have mm-hmm. to be a person that can transition very yeah. easily. And you have to be honest with yourself because not everybody can. Startups have a lot of gray. Yeah. There's and, a lot of gray. <laughs> and yeah. ambiguity is a way of life. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Your technology may or may not work if you're selling technology. Your customers may or may not like it. You may make it or you may not. And most startups have multiple pivots yeah. and most don't make it and those who do have typically reinvented themselves several times so when that reinvention occurs you also have to reinvent what your contribution to the business mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. and so, so that's be thinking about that as well exactly yeah. so you have to love ambiguity you have to love change and you have to pivot fast to do wow. it and you may not be learning from the most experienced people because often startups are full of a lot of people where you're yeah. all kind of learning together but yes. you're not necessarily learning best practices Mm. So you have to be cautious. It can be right for you. Now, culturally, they're usually a lot of fun. They're often in cool locations and urban areas. They're often full of young people. And so it can be... A few rules and regulations (laughs) in terms of what we're wearing, what hours we're working, or anything like that. So it could appeal to your independence streak, but Mm -hmm. it may not be always the best career foundation. Now, did you work in any startups? Yes, I've done a couple startups. You have. And uh, so they can be quite exciting. Yeah. I did... enjoy it two of them did not make it so <laughs> well, right. yeah that's, so that does happen it does um, happen they run out of money is what happens yeah you know yeah. Uh, investors make bets and they know that often it won't work out so i'm i enjoy uh the mid-sized companies the best that's mm-hmm. what i'm at right now where it's not a huge you know 60 billion dollar corporation but it's also not a startup right. um you know i'm 450 person company right now oh, wow. well, yeah. 200 million plus revenue and and so in that scenario, you have an established base. You need to protect the existing customer base and uh, the revenue, as well as continue to grow the business. Yeah. So I was just going to ask you what you would consider a mid-sized company. So, Well, it's it's everyone yeah. has a different yeah, definition. Yeah, everybody has a different <laughs> definition. That's, that's true. But I would say a more established, high-growth company yeah, right, is, um, right. is one that has an existing revenue stream. They're not stream. waiting on their next funding round from the VC. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they actually have a revenue stream. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And they're profitable. And they're profitable. Right. So what type of culture do you try to create in your workplace? Well, it's it's an interesting question. I try to keep it very transparent. Mm-hmm. I try to share any information I can because then it allows people to do their job. But obviously you have to protect confidentiality of the business as well. But very open, transparent, relatively casual. I yeah. like work environments where uh, it has more of a workshop feel than a presentation feel. Yeah. I think it can get very stilted otherwise and mm-hmm. not conducive to the best decision making. So I think that informal approach, I like when everybody can speak up. And feel comfortable speaking up, right? And feel comfortable speaking up. Um, I like when we can move people around quite a bit. I think that's one of the most important things early in your career is try to do a couple little pivots within the company. some exposure. Do you like when someone walks in and says, look, I really think I would be great at this. Can you give me a shot trying it? Yeah, well, it's all how they approach it, right? right. It's like, I always respect somebody who has the guts to come in (laughs) and say, you know, hey, I have a passion around this or I have an interest in this or just maybe even less direct than, Mm -hmm. will you give me the job? It's more... I really think that we could make a difference in this company. You know, mm. like if you put the company's needs first or in our customers, right. but I believe what they can a- do for you, not what you can do for them. Exactly. Yeah. Or for our customers, even better. Oh, true. So, true that. Yeah. Um, you know, I really believe that we'd have a better customer experience mm. and it would be delivering more value if we did this or we did that. What do you think about that? Or how could I learn more about this? Right. Mm. Always be curious. Right. Always be curious. Uh, and then if you think it's a good idea, you might let that person head that, exactly. head that up. And form relationships. I mean, there mm-hmm. are employees within the company that very clearly seek me out. They take the initiative. They always do it respectfully. They always 
reading whether it's right. the magic moment right. to approach me, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is important. Right. And there are magic moments, if right? You're doing this yeah. at your desk. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking down, scowling at the moment. Yeah. You know, might not be the right time. You've got two stacks of phone calls to return, not the best time. Yeah. Yeah. But to me, it's all about taking initiative, mm. having passion, caring, and really trying to just make a difference. So do you think those are the best tips for moving up to the level that you have moved up? Yeah, just demonstrate that you have an interest and can do it. And the other thing is don't worry about what your title is or what your pay is. When opportunity comes knocking, grab it. I've seen two different types of primary responses when someone quits or somebody goes on maternity leave and there's a gap. Uh, one employee says, wow, okay, you know, so-and-so's out. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, how can I help? Well, yeah. what were their core job responsibilities? Oh, they did this presentation for you. Oh, they took care of this. Can I help you on a temporary basis to do that? I love that. Right. Yeah. Because basically it's a, it's win a trial. Right there. Yeah. It's a win-win yeah. and it's a trial for them mm-hmm. where they get to try the job. I get to see how they do. I'll often promote them. Right. I'll just give them the job because right, of that. Right. The other kind says, well, just because someone left, I'm not getting dumped on their yeah, extra right. work, right? I'm not taking on. I'm not yeah. working two jobs. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't have the title or the salary. Yeah, or you or... are not paying me enough yeah. or whatever. And so they just have major attitude problems. It's short-sighted. Right? Oh, extremely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so and another great tip. They're just not going to move forward in their career because right. so often – you got to seize the moment right. and take the opportunity and demonstrate you can do it. When it's dropped right in front of you, you have to recognize yep. it right. and, that's and go with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was and thinking. the money and the title will fall. And if they don't, you'll have the experience to go jump that's elsewhere. That's right. It's another thing to add to your resume or, exactly. or your LinkedIn. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so could you just tell us for people considering going into this as a profession, what a typical day is like for you? Yeah, a typical day is all about doing different things. You've always got to be aware of the external environment. So if you should never go through a day without thinking about the competition, your customers, what value the competition offers your customers that you don't. What are they doing differently? And it even could be things that you wouldn't think necessarily customers would value. Like maybe they charge three times what you do. Well, So suddenly they think, well, they must be better. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. So, I mean, you have to keep an open mind or they offer a different service pack. Mm -hmm. or they package it different or price it different or staff it differently. Mm -hmm. So you really need to think about your competition, what they're doing, and then also what the unmet needs are out there. So hmm. what is what no one doing? What gaps can you fill? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, Amazon didn't exist at one point right. and mm. they filled a gap. So for sure. how do you? <laughs> <laughs> That's the understatement of the year. <laughs> so how do you fill a gap out there? So my day is all about thinking externally and then internally is more how do you get things done? That's mm-hmm. more yeah. how do you work with your teams? How do you create the right kind of environment? And how do you try to reduce noise, friction and drama? Right. Yeah. So if, if <laughs> that's a big part of a <laughs> if, managing role, I suppose. It, exactly. So if you hear someone making a big deal about another department or something, you got to say, OK, well, what am I doing to make the situation better? How mm-hmm. can we move forward to kind of decompress mm-hmm. the emotions yeah. and get on with doing the right thing for the company? So do you tend to have team meetings once a day? Or? Yeah, I, yeah, I have team meetings. Um, I do have the formal ones. I have lots of informal touch points. I yeah. try not to overly fill my schedule uh, because I need that informal time to Mm -hmm. walk around, Mm -hmm. to really understand, to pivot quickly. So when you identify a gap or a need or something that needs to be altered, do you then turn to your team and say, make this happen? Well, I try to look for, okay, we got to make this done. Who has the bandwidth to do it? Because typically bandwidth is the big issue. So who can take this and run with it? How gnarly is it? Right? <laughs> is it is it just work that needs to be done that a smart, competent individual can just do independently or a smaller team? Or does it involve changing behavior of other functions or other players outside the company, which are more complex situations? So at my level as the chief marketing officer, I try to focus on those super complex, hard to solve for problems that may require additional air cover. My job is to provide resources and air cover and solve for problems. It's not to do the actual individual work, right? It's right. to manage the overview and strategy mm-hmm. of the work. And then, but if I find somebody who's really competent and on top of things, I let them rip. You know, I don't right. try to micromanage them because my time is better spent elsewhere. Right. That's got to be the best feeling, though, when you can just confidently <laughs> oh, leave absolutely. it in somebody else's. Absolutely. And yeah. even if things go really wrong, 
as long as I have the confidence for them to come find me and make yeah. and problem solve and not right. bury it, yeah, all the better. And I think that's the relationship you want with your manager. Absolutely. If there's problems, you don't hide them. Yeah. You surface them and then say, "Here's what I'm doing to address them." They always come back to bite you. Yeah, yeah. it's not worth it. Yeah, exactly. just say, "Yeah, I screwed this up." And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and now what are we gonna do? <laughs> Let's figure this out. And yeah. always be willing to tell your boss when you can't do something. Yeah, uh, you know, I had a situation very early in my career where there was a lot of pressure to get something done, and so I just went along with it, hoping it all work out, mm-hmm. full well knowing that it wasn't doable. If it's not doable, it's better to have the tough upfront conversation. Right than the why didn't you let me know after it failed right. type conversation. Exactly. So I'm curious in your company and all the companies you've been working in, what the availability of internships have been. And if someone is just starting out in this field and looking to be in marketing, what is the best way to break into this industry? Well, to break into marketing, you really need to start early. And I think that's mm-hmm. important. It doesn't mean you can't get in if you start later. But if you think you have an interest in business, um, I would start thinking about it your freshman year in college. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would really try to seek out an internship. And I'd be more focused on getting the internship than worrying about maximizing your income if you're in the financial position to do so, of course. Right. Um, but internships are essentially stepping stones. Mm-hmm. And it almost doesn't matter what the first internship is. It doesn't have to be the perfect one. It just has to be one where you can start to learn the ropes and then the next summer you can leapfrog to an even better internship that closer aligns with your needs. Um, when I see candidates out of undergraduate coming into my office that have done no internships, it's a huge red flag. It's okay, what was going on in their life? What were they doing with their time yeah. that they yeah. didn't make this a priority? Now, it could be just that they didn't have the financial wherewithal or they just had bad luck and I'm fine with that. But if it signals laziness or lack of initiative initiative that's, that's a, a huge red flag. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And keep in mind that there are so many people who have made those stepping right. stone so moves. So that's who you're up against. That's yeah. who you're up against. And those are the ones I'm going to take every single time. Right. Because they now, already are these, know. Are these primarily paid or unpaid internships? Uh, most of them pay something now. Okay. Because uh, there was a little bit of a backlash, appropriately so, of unpaid Yes, I remember <laughs> reading a lot about and, that. Yeah. And if you have an unpaid one, just make sure there's reasonable boundaries on it okay. right yeah. um you know negotiate well okay if this is unpaid i get it and i'd really like to contribute and learn but i also need to work part-time right right so uh, i can elsewhere. give you 20 hours of my week but i get to spend the other 20 actually exactly. making some money somewhere. and most yeah. um legitimate companies are willing to pay something yeah. so it's it's really and don't worry about a couple dollar difference right what they right. pay you it's, it's more it's, about it's the getting experience. into because you remember they're making a big investment in you well beyond the paycheck they're mm-hmm. giving their time and resource Absolutely. and energy commitment. And it's an right. exposure. You can kind of see where do I fit in this marketing world? Where should I focus in school? Yeah. Do you exactly. know, right. you what know classes should I be focusing on? Yeah. Sure. You can be observer. It's also a very social aspect. All of our mm-hmm. interns get along, get and to make know each some other. Make new connections. Make new connections. Add but to your LinkedIn. Also, <laughs> uh, see what other interns are working on. Even if you have the project that you have zero interest in, yep. you can see what others are working on. So then maybe you can pivot to that one next year. Oh, Never okay. underestimate the power of passion and engagement, right? And making the first move. Mm. If an intern, was in the finance department this summer, but popped into my office once or twice and said, next year, I'd really like to be considered for your department. Man, they'd be in gold, right? right? (laughs) Just showing that initiative. (laughs) Yeah. Because they... You'd be like, ping me this time next (laughs) year. Uh, Exactly. So um, don't be too shy because uh, most executives are willing and able and in a position to help if you take the initiative. But Mm -hmm. what they don't like is just passive and then entitlement, right? Entitlement's the worst, right? Because it's like, you know, I didn't really do anything interesting this year for you, but now I expect X, Y, Z. I don't think so. No, exactly. Especially considering how hard you've worked to get to where you are. Exactly. When you're younger, entitlement, there's no room for that. No. Yes. That comes with age. Exactly. Uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, Rob. Well, this has been amazing and so invaluable to anybody thinking about going into marketing or business management. Amazing tips here. Yeah, I've definitely learned a lot from you today. And I really found this interesting. Getting your perspective has been a real education. So thank you for being here and sharing that with us. Yeah, thank you so much for coming in today. Okay, good. My pleasure. Thank you. Great. Enjoy the rest of your day.
I'm so happy we could get Rob on the show. I know. We're so lucky he made the time to do our podcast. He has a wealth of knowledge for anyone pursuing a career in business. Or any career at all, for that matter. Right. Any career. Yes. And we're so appreciative of Rob sharing them all with you. You can follow Rob over on LinkedIn, and we will include that link in the show notes. Exactly. And on another note, if you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to our show. Yes, please do it. It only takes a second, and it helps others to find our show. Right, and we want to channel a little Joe Rogan here, move up in the ranks. Yeah, <laughs> just even a fraction of Joe Rogan would be, would, would be great. Would be wonderful, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to anyone that has taken the time to subscribe to our podcast. And thanks to anyone that has left us a rating or review. Those also help us a lot. We really, really appreciate each and every one. Yeah, we definitely do. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you so much for listening. And as a final note, anyone interested in learning more about our business, academic and career advising services, we invite you to visit our website and we will include that link in the show notes. We assist people with changing careers, possibly finding that first job out of college, the college admissions process, selecting an academic major, deciding on a career, or things of that nature. You can check it all out on our website, Academic and Career Advising Services. We are located in Kennebunk, Maine. However, for your convenience, we also offer video conferencing services. You're never too old to change your career or to go back to college, and you're never too young to begin thinking about your future. We enjoy serving people of all ages. If you enjoyed listening to today's podcast and would like to help us out, could you please leave a rating or review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? This really helps others to find our podcast. We would greatly appreciate it. Also, to get all the latest on upcoming episodes, please follow us on social media. All of those links will be included in the show notes. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks so much for listening.